Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Good Shepherd. As always, we are glad you could be with us, and we hope that this morning's worship experience is an important part of your journey of faith as we continue to travel together. Uh, just a reminder for next weekend, uh, we will be doing a blessing of the backpacks and vocations, and especially during everything that's going on in this pandemic. So if you would like to have those things present with you um, at the time for service, um, then you can be a part of that as well, and all are invited uh, to do that, whether it's your books and backpacks, or whether it's things you use for teaching, or work boots or tools, it's all open for, <laughs> for blessings. So please join us for that again at the beginning um, of our service next week. And now let us continue with the Thanksgiving for baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O oh God, from the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people, uh, Israel, from slavery into freedom. And at the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord and the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
first reading is from the book of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God, of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brother also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. I Am I in the place of God? Even though you intend to do harm to me, God intended for good, for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let it all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in the honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here ends the reading of the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This past Friday was the, the anniversary of 9-11, a day when horrible atrocities were committed in the name of God, and the events that that day led to, to a violent response from our own nation as it pursued justice was also in the name of God. Thousands of men, women, and children on all sides have lost lives. And whatever we think or feel about the events of this past several years, it must be good for us to ask, how does one follow Jesus and practice forgiveness in such a time? I have to be perfectly honest and say that I'm not entirely certain how to answer that question, except to say that maybe Jesus knew there would be times such as these. One day, on a hill by a lake, he gathered his disciples and told them to pray like this. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Perhaps that is where we begin. With all the hurt and pain and shame and guilt and anger and betrayal, perhaps that is where we can begin today. Last week, we discussed Jesus' teaching on loving folks who hurt other people. The community was to confront them repeatedly until they stopped sinning and repented. And this week, Jesus turns to the behavior and responsibilities of the victims. I think it's especially important for us as the body of Christ in this world to pay attention to what Jesus does and does not ask of his righteous victims. First, it's important to reiterate that in Matthew 18, 15 to 20, Jesus is calling his followers to love perpetrators of sin by confronting them with the way that their sins have harmed others. This isn't a one-time action that dissolves our responsibility toward hurtful people, but its ever-widening portions of the community are to confront the person, to help him or her stop hurting others for their own good. And in the context of this week's discussion about of forgiving sin, we must therefore be clear that forgiveness is not about excusing sin or permitting harmful behavior to continue. Christian responsibility towards perpetrators who hurt others is to lovingly, repeatedly call them to repentance, just like Jesus did with the tax collectors and sinners. What then is the responsibility of victims of other sins? I mean, come on, if I were to spend any time talking about our Genesis text, of all people, Joseph would have a reason to be slightly angry at his brothers for the way they treated him. And again, prior to even last week's gospel, Jesus tells the parable of the shepherd bringing the lost sheep back into the fold. And then last week, Jesus offers instructions on how to correct or reprove the actions of another Christian in the church. And that leads again to today's two-part lesson about how many times we ought to forgive a fellow Christian. Jesus answered, 
basically forgive them more times than you can even count. And the parable of the unforgiving servant is told. At the outset, Jesus says this parable should shape how we understand the reign of God. As is the case in many parables, extraordinary circumstances seem to highlight certain details. A servant owes 10,000 talents. Just to give you an idea, that would take about 150,000 years for a laborer to pay off every cent earned if every day's wages went to paying off that debt. It was not a small amount. That impossibility does not so much highlight the whole of the debt that the servant dug as it highlights the incomprehensible magnitude of God's willingness to forgive us. Yet this forgiven servant threatens a fellow servant to pay what is owed to him, which is the equivalent of about 100 days labor, which, yes, is a pretty good amount, but it's kind of measly compared to the forgiveness that was just granted to him. And then, of course, the master hears this and is irked, to say the least. Peter was understandably confused, as he always is, <laughs> and willing to ask about it. When Jesus extended the responsibility to love our neighbors by pursuing them to stop and repent of behaviors that harmed others. He then asked Jesus how many times he was required to forgive someone. Jesus had already said that his followers should attempt to stop someone from sinning against others at least three times. Though I would argue Jesus spent his, life, his entire life doing this, and so we are as well. But still, Peter is asking about forgiving someone seven times, if that was enough, more than double the number of times that Jesus has said to confront a perpetrator. And Jesus basically tells him, forgiveness must be infinite. Perhaps we could call this lesson trying to get around having the chickens come home to roost and failing miserably. Yes, that's a long title, but there's a lot going on here. Again, Peter is trying to pin Jesus down as to how often one should forgive a fellow believer. Peter suggests the complete number of seven, and Jesus swats it down like an annoying fly. Not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Or 70 times seven. The Greek isn't exactly clear either way. It's a lot. In other words, forgiveness is not an event. But it's a process. It is designed to free both the offender and the victim. To work on reconciliation and restoration. Yet because of our fear and tendency to be judging with one another, we have turned to a more punitive response and punishment. Thus perpetuating the cycles of violence and pain and suffering. Jesus doesn't stop with treatment of fellow believers. He launches into a parable with societal impact in the story of the unforgiving servant. We are to be the agent, agents of mercy, not justice and retribution and judgment. All one has to do is look at the systemic structures of racism and violence and criminal justice and consumer debt to see how far we as a culture have strayed from Jesus' instructions. We are conditioned to judge worth and place and value rather than practice neighbor love and mercy. And the only way to break the cycle is to turn our hearts to the one who we claim to follow and begin to practice what he preaches. Our congregation and our society must examine its complicity in the structures that are not of God and decide together a way forward that shows mercy and restoration. We must practice forgiveness and mercy until our hearts break open and fill us with Christ's life, light and love that is poured out into the world. Emotionally, this is a difficult parable because we don't want to ask anything of victims. Yet I think the parable is essential for two reasons. Because first, it helps us understand what is and what isn't forgiveness. I don't think the king even after being compassionate to the slave, would ever loan him money again or trust him with anything. Forgiveness is by no means pretending that the offense didn't occur or trusting the perpetrator with any responsibility that they have demonstrated that they don't deserve. For
Forgiveness isn't declaring someone innocent when they aren't. Forgiveness, as explained by the parable, isn't giving up pursuing what we are owed by those who have hurt us. If either of the debtors attempted to repay their debts, I think that that would have been welcomed in the parable. But in this section we read, read last week, Jesus calls for the community to continually pressure the offender to repent. That is to undo the effects of the sin and to make restitution. But the forgiveness that Jesus calls us to is to stop seeking that which we are owed by those who have hurt us. Renouncing debt that is owed is what Joseph does in this week's reading and what Paul counsels in 1 Corinthians 6. This is why Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Ceasing pursuit of what we are owed by those who have sinned against us doesn't absolve the perpetrator of their responsibility to still try to make restitution, but it does free us from waiting on another for healing. Forgiving is saying that God is sufficient for us. This is the second gift in this difficult parable. It helps solidify one aspect of God's love. God forgoes restitution for all of our sins. Repenting is still good, and I would even argue essential, in order to try healing the ways that we hurt God and others. But God doesn't need us to do that. This is our Christian response to human sin. As a community, we love the sinner by helping her or him stop hurting other people. We love the victim by helping her or him let go of the restitution that they are owed. The way this parable shapes our understanding of God's reign is twofold. It offers us a glimpse of God's incomprehensible proclivity to forgive us and to say that divine forgiveness must shape how we treat others. I'll confess, forgiveness can be a complicated concept. Most people begin to grasp it as a young child when playing with another young child. One child physically or emotionally hurts one of the children, and then an adult offers an instruction to forgive. It's a good lesson for a child to learn that if somebody intentionally or unintentionally knocks over your blocks, you need to let that act not ruin your whole day. Yet we grow in age, and the situations that involve a call for forgiveness get more complicated. Do we let bygones be bygones if a bully steals our lunch? Must we forgive and forget those unwanted double punches to our face from a stranger? Should we turn a blind eye to someone's pattern of abuse? It does no good for us or for the other person if we passively accept this harmful behavior out like a childlike understanding of forgiveness. Recall the immediately prior to today's lesson Jesus was teaching how to correct another Christian's behavior. So perhaps we must consider how reproving another person may be the necessary step for that person to desire forgiveness and to make amends for their actions. Our understanding of forgiveness must develop beyond what we initially learn as children playing with others, especially when the offending behavior shows a pattern of abuse instead of a one-time accidental offense. A summary of a more mature understanding of forgiveness is this. We need not like the person after forgiving them, nor do we have to maintain a relationship with them. Forgiveness is for us to be liberated from the power that person's action has over us. And we should hope that our forgiveness will direct the person toward being liberated from whatever is driving them toward this unhealthy behavior. The attacks of 9-11 and our response to that attack were claimed to be done in the name of God. But I just have to ask, is this really the way God wants us to act in the world? I think our readings were to answer that differently than we have in the past. Once again, as we look at our world and the systemic structures of racism and violence and criminal justice in it, we have to ask ourselves, how would God want us to look at these issues and correct them? Unfortunately, we are as in the same amount of agreement on how to respond to that as we are to how to respond to the attacks of 9-11. Lord, have mercy. We are better than this. 
And we have been shown a better way to learn and deal with conflicts and attacks. And I pray we spend more time in prayer with God and listen to those better ways in the future. And let all God's children say amen. 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 Opinions. 
Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those on our prayer and care list. We especially pray this morning for Lisa Donovan, who is recovering from liver transplant. And we also pray prayers of healing for Susan. We pray for those we name silently in our hearts at this time. We pray for all those who have lost a loved one recently. We especially pray for the family and friends of Sharon. We hope they can find comfort and peace through your promise of everlasting life. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that taught us how to bow to you, and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good that we should at all times, and that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, holy God, mighty and immortal, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day broke the bonds of death opening to us the way of everlasting life, and giving us a foretaste of the feast to come. And so with the church on earth and the hosts in heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
And now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and always keep you in God's grace. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer after communion. We give you thanks, thanks gracious God, God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of our Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst. Guided by the example of the Saint Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, show to the Heavenly Father, hear these words of blessing. Mother and God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth, 